they insisted that I get mic'd up. I hate using these things. And I, I don't use them all that frequently. And the one, one time I did, I was at a client site. And they had a, this is uh, for a very large US uh, medical equipment manufacturer. And I was doing a lot presentation to about 100 people. And I had this auditorium. And before the presentation started, I said, oh, excuse me one minute. I have to go to the washroom. I think most of you can figure out what happened. <laughs> I walk back into the classroom. Everybody is killing themselves laughing, and I have no idea why. Until somebody, until somebody fesses up that I had left the mic on when I went to the washroom. <laughs> Fortunately, I, had not, I didn't say anything too untoward about the client. You know how some people can walk into a, oh, geez, these guys here. Oh, God, what a bunch of fools I'm having to work with. So it was a, it was a very, very good icebreaker. <laughs> I think something that, Linda, wouldn't be out of your presentation there, being able to express vulnerabilities to your client and help in, be one of your agile minds? Oh, thank you. You're not, you've just become my new best friend. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming to, my, coming to the presentation. Can we do Agile? Barriers to Agile adoption. So the, what, I, what I want to be able to address here and talk to you about and, get, and invite your participation in is the question that often happens, the Agile conversation starts up and everyone goes, yeah, that, all that stuff sounds really cool, except we're different. We don't think we can do it here. We're safety critical. We do we do hardware. We're under we are audit we have we work under government regulations, and we we have to follow specific paths. So we can't do agile. And then there's the other flip side of the question. Yeah, we we did everything. We got the coaches in. We got the tools. We did scrums. We had the standups, and it didn't work. In fact. It was a disaster. So why didn't this happen? And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I probably let a big secret out of the bag here. It's been known. It's happened. I know this is totally shocking. But some Agile projects actually fail. <laughs> I know that's a shock. That's shocking. So I, what, I, what I want to do is maybe take you through and look at the question because it's always the there's the barriers to Agile adoption. What do I think? And what would I like, and my experience is suggesting, what are the barriers to agile adoption? What are the barriers for an organ, and this is more than beyond agile. What are the barriers to an organization being able to successfully deliver product or service to their stakeholders and create value? So for those of you who know me, okay, I'm a bit of an aviation geek, although I haven't flown in a long time, and uh, I've been in the industry a long, long time, enough to remember Fortran and uh, PDP 11s, even PDP 8s, paper tape, punch cards. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 th I consider myself amazingly privileged to be part of this industry because look what we've gone from. We've gone from computers being closeted in large rooms to basically ubiquitous computing. And I know it's popular to talk a lot in our industry about how this here has more computer horsepower and memory than a large corporate mainframe did in back in the 80s. What I think is amazing about our industry is how it's democratized people. How, it's put, how many of us 30 years ago would never have dreamed that we could be working in a corporate environment from our house, that we could have our own small companies, that people could have access to information that used to only be controlled by a by a few privileged. That, I think, is a pretty, ex that is the really exciting thing that I've seen happen in our industry in the last 30 years. So, can any project be agile? So, here's what I want, here's what I want to do right now. I want to take, uh, I want you to form into a team. So, we've got the tables here, okay? Uh, have about at least four to five people. So if you're a table of three, you might want to join another table of three or uh, get together. Have a facilitator for your team. We don't have post-it notes here. 
But I'd like you to write on a piece of paper what you think why a project can or cannot be agile. So take about five minutes. Um, take about five minutes to do that. Now I'm not. I'm not going to do the constructing an affinity map here. So let's just take the five minutes, get together, try to come up with ideas. What are, do you think are the impediments to an organization being able to adopt Agile or to be effective at using Agile? One more minute.
So I'm just going to go around to a couple of tables and just ask you to share some of the enablers and impediments that uh, you came up with as to why do you think a T, why can a project, can be any project be agile? So let's see. I think there were some pretty intense conversations happening here. So who wants, who wants to be the spoke speaker for the table here? Oh, you look like it. you're. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, here, are I don't want to get too intimate here, you know, it's like... Oh. <laughs> so, um, we, we discussed a few impediments. One is the mindset, uh, resistance to change. Okay, this is how we've been doing it all along. Why do we need to change? Why are we really doing it? Why are we doing it just for the sake of being agile? So, that's one thing we talked about. Um, the other thing was the dependencies. I say, when you have large team, I'm agile, but he's not. I depend on him. So, who starts first? So that kind of thing. That's those are and then, uh, scope. We talked about scope uh, where in situations where there are contract, there are rigid contract. This is exactly how I want it. This is exactly when I want it. When it's so, when when the expectation is like that, it's hard to be a guy. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's one one of we, that one that's going to probably come up a lot is the mindset. That's a really good one to capture. Let's see, who's going to be my next victim here? Ah! <laughs> Hi. Um, do I can or cannot? Can, both. Okay. Yeah, like, what were some of your lead? A lot of them are just sort of the converse of each other. So cannot was inertia, culture, um, people in the organization, either on the team or in the leadership, being unwilling to explore or try something new if they're not already agile. Um, legal and contractual limitations could be a preventer. Um, if you can't get team buy-in, um, if you can't have regular access to converse and work with your stakeholders or your customer. Um, and then some of the reasons that you could be able to be agile might be um, if you're already in a state of uncertainty, you're probably more willing to explore and try something. Um, if your expectations are aligned and um, you have management support. And then there's all the obvious ones about small teams and co-location and all that. Okay, thank you. I mean, a couple of points that I've heard here before, I just wanted to sort of comment on them as well. You know, you were, for example, you were mentioning the case of, well, are we doing Agile just to change? I mean, ultimately, that's a, that is a very good business case we have to make. Are we going to do Agile because, well, it's just kind of the cool thing to do and it looks good on my resume? Part of it is, how does it help the business create value? That's one, that's one of the big that's one of the points that we always want to have to have to be addressing. And I think one of the points here, I'm just trying to remember, sorry, I'm running on about four hours of sleep a night right now. I'm my yeah. <laughs> but I think one of the things that you brought up here is um, getting the need. Why do we need to do this? And usually what I have found in a lot of organizations where I'm becoming involved with an agile transformation is one. They've just had a disaster. You know, so it's like, okay, we've got nothing to lose. Why don't we try this? And uh, those of you who are following the Scaled Agile Framework forums, that was one of the cases at John Deere. So they were very open and fortunately had, were pleasantly surprised. Or someone forward looking in the company realizes, we can't keep doing business like this because our competitors are going to eat our lunch. We need to get our, we need to get our product and services out faster we can't be getting new services out every two years and our competitors getting it out every quarter. Uh, let's see, who else?
So you, <laughs> you thought, okay, we're at the front, he's at the back, we're never going to get past him. Shouldn't have made eye contact with him. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of the items we talked about were, um, uh, again, like customer contract uh, limitations. Uh, also, um, if it's, if the requirements are such that it's hard to kind of iterate and change your mind as you go, so like for example, if you're building a, a large building, you, you can't really build half the building and then say, actually a better way to do the basement would be X, Y, Z. Um, you obviously you haven't done home renovations before. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and that we are talking a little bit about uh, like very large teams uh, can be difficult to, uh, to implement Agile in, though we didn't get into uh, scaled Agile at all in, in that particular point. Okay. What were some of the enablers you came up with? Um, well, kind of just the, the, the reverse is like uh, shared mindset within your team to, uh, to want to move forward with it. Um, ability to break things down into uh, small enough pieces to, uh, um, to make things more bite size and, uh, and also have those pieces in such a way that uh, as things move forward, you, you can kind of tweak them. Okay. Thank you. And I maybe just one more table here. I'm going to have to, of course, harass. I'm just going to harass. Okay. <laughs> okay. So some of the things were already mentioned, but we also talked about highly regulated and safety issues as a possible disabler. You hear that a lot, like, well, you have to be safe for NASA, we can't use this agile thing. Um, we also hear from back-end technologists that you can't do architecture back-end in an agile way. Also, we would have the vendor process restrictions. If you have vendors or teams that you interface with, it can be challenging to do agile. And then, yeah, we also mentioned the leadership business processes and the barriers around that. We didn't get to the enablers. Okay. So, so a wide variety of enablers. Some are what I would say a lot were the, around the conversations of mindset. Others were legacy environment or contractual obligations. So let's see. Let's see. Let's explore this a little bit. So a lovely friend of mine, Janita Andrea, once coined the term <coughs> Cinderella Agile. And this is the perfect, pretty agile. This is your team is able to operate in a you know, short sprint, you know, two weeks, four weeks. You have a dedicated 24-7 at your beck and call product owner. You have a scrum master who brings donuts and coffee for you in the morning. You know? You have you have a backlog that you can get, that you can groom. The team loves each other. We are we are wonderful in our retrospectives, and we are capable of delivering new product to a waiting customer every every sprint. This is your project. <laughs> you know, we can't do agile because we don't look like Cinderella. We are operating in a regulated environment. The guys in the back office, the architect says, there's no way we can build incremental architecture. We have a huge project. We have 600 people on, in our effort here. No way that we can, we don't look like that. We cannot do agile. But then there's the other, there's the other one that happens all the time. How many have heard the expression cargo cult? Okay. What's a cargo cult? that you have something when you don't have it, right? So this was this guy in Iceland being fed by the army. And once the war was over, they were uh, representing the, the airports, the plane like that, expecting them to come again and feed them again. Yeah, exactly, thank you. Yeah, this was in the, in the Southeast Asian islands. The natives have gotten very used to the idea, had assumed that they were receiving all kinds of benefits from the army bases there. And then when the army bases left, they weren't getting the benefits anymore. So they started building mock-ups of the planes. Apparently some of the natives would even have coconuts over their ears like they're, you know, for the, for the communication. Not making the connection that it was not 
the food was not coming from the image of the airplanes or the fat or they're building the base. They couldn't make that connection. And frequently, the, the metaphor cargo cult agile is used for many organizations. They adopt the practices without understanding the intention behind the practices. And they take a very rigid, and, even to, and it even gets to the point where they take an extremely rigid perspective. You can't do it that way. It's not agile. We don't do design because that's not agile. Philip Critchen once told me of a case where he did an assessment over an organization that just had an agile disaster. This was for an avionics manufacturer. And they had, a, and they had, a, they had hired an agile coach who brought in XP. And they decided that they weren't going to do design because that's not agile in XP. And they would refactor, right? Architecture merely emer architecture emerges. And so what was happening is the team would start progressing. And things were going really well for the first few sprints. And then the backlog of refactoring started to grow and grow and grow to the point where each sprint, each iteration, now was completely dealing with refactorings to the point where they were moving actually back about halfway into the project. They were actually moving backwards. They were having to undo functionality and refactor it. So definitely, this idea of if we follow the practices rigidly without taking into regard the context of the environment we're operating in, we are certainly going to have these agile failures. So I consider this to be symptomatic, the fact that we can't do agile because we don't look like Cinderella. Or well, we did agile, but it blew up in our faces is symptomatic of trying to define Agile in terms of specific practices. We're not looking at it as a mindset. And this is where I have people saying it's a mindset. It becomes very, very important. What I have observed is that somehow, what's the first, for those of you who consider yourselves really cool hip Agilists, what is the first article of the Agile Manifesto? Say pardon? Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So whatever happened to the individuals? Because often the way we talk about Agile is in terms of processes and tools. The, ar the argument or the thesis I want to put before you is that any project can be Agile. It is a mindset. But what, stop what is stopping that mindset from emerging? Yes. In a regulated environment, we can be agile. We've done it. In large environments, we can be agile. We can have done it. In legacy environments, we can be agile. We've done it. That agile is not going to look like the Cinderella agile. But it's going to be an agile. It's going to be a way of delivering more value within the context of your organization. So let's take a look at some of the things that that mindset is trying to conquer here. So the, like I said, the Agile conversation seems to have gener degenerated into arguments over specific tools and processes. While these are important, they are enablers. Simply focusing on what is Agile and what's not, I think, is a waste of energy on our part. Okay. This is my favorite. You know, and whenever anyone asks me to define what Agile is, I like, I like this from the original XP book. Embrace change. Because I think that's really what we're trying to be in a position of doing. It's a great mantra. Embrace change. The ability to rather than try to see change as an evil variance, a scope creep, how do we use change to create greater value in the product and services that we're offering? So the question is, how do we embrace change? How do we use change to our advantage? Because again, I'm dating myself here. When I grew up as a young programmer and engineer, change was something to be fought back vigorously. Change was often expressed in terms of scope creep. Now we're saying value is created by change. So how do we embrace that? What does it really take to be agile? Obviously, I told you I was an aviation fanatic. 
Any, any aviation geeks here recognize what that is? That's an F-86 Sabre. That plane is older than I am, thank goodness. That was the main US fighter in the Korean War. And this chap here, some of you may have known that I've talked about this guy before. You know, I was a, pi I was a pilot. This is one of the guys who is my hero. Guys like Chuck Yeager, this guy here. This guy is called 42nd Boyd. And he was a, um, he was a, he was a uh, Korean War pilot, and a very good one. He earned the moniker 42nd because he had a standing bet of $20. And that's when like $20 was like real money, right? You could buy family groceries for a month. Now all I can buy is a coffee. And he, he had a standing bet uh, for $20 that if he took his plane and started from a position of disadvantage, in other words, he was in front of your plane. So this is how you're flying, okay? Him in front, you behind. Right? This is your position of advantage because your guns are on his tail. He's dead. Right? That's the position you want to shoot from. You're behind your, your opponent. So he says, I'll start from this position. And in 40 seconds, I'll be back here. No one ever collected on the bet. And he was able to define agility in terms of maneuvering uh, for those of you who are familiar with military thought, maneuver warfare, actually a lot of his thoughts became the basis of war fighting practices used by the US Marines. He said to, agility is executing your ODA loop faster than your adversaries. So the intent was, in a dogfight, I've got to be able to observe, figure out what's happening around me, make a decision and act on that decision faster than you. So if Kirk and I got into our airplanes and decided to have a dogfight, if, if I can make true observations, orient myself, and decide faster than Kirk, then it's likely I'm going to win. And he understood that. And that's how he defined agility. And it came into this is his decision-making model. We observe the events around us. We have a mental model, how, how we interpret the world, right? How we interpret the world is based on our upbringing, on our education, on our experiences, previous experiences, the new experiences. So we have this whole model here that we just don't take the raw observations. We don't take the raw data. We try and plug it into some kind of mental model. From there, we make a decision. We act on it. It changes the world around us. We observe again, and we run through this loop fast. Now, there are some issues with this loop. So th he's saying, execute this loop faster. Execute this loop faster than your opponent, and you will win. And it seems really trivial, but this is a very, I said, this, this is the basis of war planning and war fighting theory for what most of the world's militaries now. Now, this has come under the what, the, uh, what is often referred to as the basis for maneuver warfare. <coughs> I don't know if any of you a couple of years ago saw the keynote given by this character here, Dr. Chet Richards. He, took a, he was a friend of Boyd's, and he took a lot of Boyd's works and theories and moved it, it, applied it to business. He wrote this great book called Certain to Win. And he took this idea of, the, of using time, the fast decision-making cycles. And he was saying, look, this crap about business is war, that's not the thing. Don't get hung up on that. You know, he's saying, I'm not saying that specific tactics of maneuver warfare or any other form of warfare apply to business. You know, I know that was a very hip thing. And remember, I don't know if any of you remember during the 90s, a lot of execs were reading The Art of War as a means of sort of justifying, let's be nasty to our employees, you know? But he's saying, however, I am claiming that Boyd's underlying strategy, the use of time as a shaping and exploiting mechanism, and the emphasis on a cultural, organizational climate that makes this possible, apply equally well to both. What we're trying to to say is agility is about fast decision-making. 
What do we need in our organization to make decisions quickly? Now apply this to Boyd's model. Boyd is saying agility is being able to execute your loop faster than your opponent. What is, who is our opponent in our world? Who is the opponent for us? What's the, where's the impediment coming from? If I was to present the idea that change is our opponent, we need to be able to make decisions faster than the rate of change in our industry. Right? I mean, if, who's an engineer here? Right? Sampling theorem. We have to be able to sample faster than the rate of change in the, in the highest frequency signal. Nyquist theorem. Right? Same idea here. We need to be able to change fast. We need to be able to make decisions faster than the rate of change. To put this in a more concrete, Linda Poppendick, Mary Poppendick, <laughs> once said, we have got to be able to deliver software to our clients faster than they can change their mind. <laughs> right? Because the way we used to do it, where we took two years to deliver a system, usually elicited the response, that's nice, great, but that was what we needed two years ago. Things have changed. We need to be able to get into this idea that we need to be able to work faster than things are changing around us. And that's different for different industries. If you are working at a California uh, web company, things are changing daily. You know, Facebook is supposedly able to update their site 50 times a day. They're doing continuous deployment. I, I worked on the, on the software for SkyTrain. We are obviously not going to do 50 updates a day. It usually takes about six months to do an update. Right? That's, the, that's the rate of change that we're working with in that environment. So the question is now, we come to this definition of what agility is. We are able to create value by learning faster than the rate of change. That would be my definition of agility. So when we ask, can we be agile? The question we, we want to ask is, can we look, create value by learning faster than the rate of change? So now, we're walking back here and saying, what are the impediments to our learning? So we come back to our model here, and what impedes agility? Okay is this part here, our ability to interpret, to observe and interpret. Notice that from our state of mind here, our orientation, this is our mental models of the world here. Notice there's a feedback to our observation. How we see the world is not raw data. We do not see the world objectively. We interpret the data. As it's flowing from our eyes, from our senses, we interpret that data. Has anyone ever heard the expression, believing is see, see, believing is see? Yeah, believing is see. Not seeing is believing. Believing is see. You see what you believe, what you want to see. There is a famous example of how 13 smoke jumpers died because they could not believe that a fire could, could go uphill towards them so quickly. In fact, a few minutes before the fire engulfed them, they were taking photographs of the fire. It shocked them. They could not believe that a fire could do that. There was a Man Gulch disaster. How many times have you looked and you thought you, you saw in a situation what you wanted to see? Your mind said, that's how I should interpret this situation. That's what, this is the issue that we're, this is the issue that we have to deal with. We have to be in a point where if this orientation, as Boyd called it, gets locked, then we will not see the, how the, we will not be able to interpret correctly the world. We will not see the changes happening around us. We will not be able to respond. We will stay in our normal models and interpretation. We will not be learning. We will not be agile. 
So the question is, what locks that orientation? OK, quickly, look at this. Tell me what you see. Who saw, who saw the girl? Who saw the saxophone player? Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see here. Anyone remember this po This is a classic Hindu poem. The wise man and the elephant, they're all blind. Each one of them touches a different part of the elephant. One touches the tusks, thinks the, elef the elephant's like a spear. One touches the, the trunk, thinks it's like a snake. The other touches the side, thinks like it's a wall. What's happening here? Are they wrong? Each one of them is correct in their own mind. But they all have a different picture of what that elephant is like. And until they can bring together their different pieces and align their different perspectives, they are not going to be able to work effectively together. So usually the solution is, OK, we need to talk more. Let's get everyone talking to one another. We'll get all this communications going. We'll have, everyone will talk. We'll have our stand-up meetings. And we'll put everyone together in the same room. And they'll talk to one another. Because more communications is better. Is it necessarily always better? This is a very interesting study. I love, I love showing this study. This was done by Pratishkova Volegs Doska. Apologies for making a hash out of a you know, Russian name here. This was a study of performance related to communications, vo the volume of communications and also the type of communications. Here's a couple of interesting observations. This communications is communications by email. This is face-to-face -face communications. Now, you tell me that it's more productive to sit and send emails to your colleagues. But notice the curve here. Definitely more communications is better. But there's a falling off point, too. Why do you think it falls off? Saturation. Saturation. And what would indicate, what would be, what, you know, we're starting to get lots and lots of people talking a lot of communication here. If we're on a project and we're talking a lot about a problem, you know, we're, const we're constantly talking about this problem, what does it suggest? Good pardon? We're not doing anything. We're not doing anything. We don't have enough information to solve the problem. We're going around in circles. So this was the interpretation, part of the interpretation of these results here. So it means it's, we're not doing anything. We're going around in circles. It means maybe we got to go out and actually stop talking and do something, and also potentially go out and get some information. And so this is where it comes. We've got this tension in our processes. On one hand, we do need to reach out. 
We need to be able to communicate with one another, exchange ideas, because if we don't talk to one another, we'll all run off with these individual perspectives. And I'm going to show you the image of what I want. You're going to construct, a, you're going to construct one, one thing, that, what you thought you saw, and I'm expecting something else. So we need to be able to c communicate with one another to resolve that. But we have this conflict where we need to focus and get the job done. We need the quiet time to actually focus on the task at hand to generate the results such that we can see, do we, did we correctly understand what was wanted? So that brings up this whole idea of what's called socio-technical systems. That people need to be part of the system. They need to be able to communicate. I have a shock. I have a little bit of a shocker for you. Coal miners in Scotland in 1940 knew more about Agile than we did. We are not leading the charge. You know, the tech industry is not leading the charge of how to improve the way that people work together. In fact, we are probably trying to catch up to what a lot of organizations already know and what a lot of disciplines already know. And this idea of socio-technical systems started to emerge in the 1940s when Albert Churns set up, started observing that in Scotland, certain mines in Scotland, the productivity was skyrocketing. And it wasn't directly attributed to the new technology that they were using. When he went to investigate, he discovered that what had happened is a change in technology had enabled the teams to move from a functional organization to small cross-functional organizations and teams and self-directed teams and communication, and found that by the combination of technology and social system, they were able to achieve extremely high productivity. It wasn't that the social system was adapting to the technical system. It was the technical system and the social systems were being jointly optimized. They depended on each other. If you look at what we are trying to accomplish in the agile world, where I raised, we become very obsessed with the technical practices and us as the people adapt to it. Well, we have to really come here to be able to communicate to set up the communications patterns, we have to look at Agile as a social system. What is Scrum? Is it a set of technical practices? Or is it a social system that says, we have somebody who wants something done. They get to say what the order. We call that person the product owner. They get to say, this is the direction I need. This is the, what I'm going to, we are going to need. We have a team. That is cap a self-organizing team that is capable of delivering that. We have a scrum master that helps try to keep everyone honest and working together. We're describing a social system. Scrum goes well beyond software. It's trying to establish this idea of a social system. So this is the intent behind scrum. Do we look at scrum as a socio-technical system, trying to help people Manage, reckon, manage their communications. So what we discovered is to make this all work, the social system. You know, this is a part of the problem. We're not very strong in expressing what we need in that social system. But what we discovered is that there are social roles people need to play in the agile world. And there are four of them. One is the supporting role, the mentor. I've got your back. This is the person who is able, this in the role, a person playing this role is the person who gives you the strength to be bold. Right? Being bold is one of the agile attributes. Courage. This is the person who gives you courage to take the initiative. This is the person who gives you courage to say to your colleagues, I think we've, we've got to talk about this. There's a mistake. This is the person who gives you courage to be able to go to the stakeholder and say, I think we've got a problem. We need to talk. This could be the scrum master, but this could also be another person on the team.
we have a sheltering role. The sheltering per the shelter the person who's doing the sheltering. This is trying. You need to be able to commute. This is the person or the role that is protecting you as a team, so that you can focus and get your work done. You need that time. We saw that curve there that says, yeah, everyone talking to everyone else. We do need to communicate, but if everyone's talking to everybody else, we're not going to get anything done. We're spinning our wheels. So this is the person who is protecting the team. They shelter the team. They're the heat shield. They hold the space for that team. Right? What role does this often fall to in Scrum? Scrum master. But what's another role that this sometimes falls to? Product owner. Right? What's it? Sorry, what's your name? Oh, no, just, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. OK, Harpo, I come up to you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy wearing a very cool collared shirt here. You're one of the developers on the team, Harpo. Do you, think you could get, do you think you could get this into, I know you guys are busy, but this is such a small change. Do you think you could get this in to, into the product? You could do the release this week? It would be really handy. I'll, I'll get you donuts and coffee. What, what? The first instinct probably would be, yeah. Your first instinct would be yes, but we try to say the, the sheltering role is go talk to the product owner. Let them know. If you want this in there, go talk to the product owner. The product owner is providing that sheltering role. Because, yeah, exactly. Your first instinct would be to say yes. As developers, we love developing. And also, we appreciate, like, wow, this, he's coming to me and asking me to do something for him, so he's going to appreciate the work I'm doing. Let's face it, that's a, real, that's a high. That's what we got into this industry. But that takes you away from what you agreed to get done. So you've got this sheltering role here, holding the workspace, giving you that safe place that you can focus and get the work done. But if you're in this hole, if you're sheltered, how, what happens? How do, we find, how do we find out that you know, we both looked at the same blot I saw a girl, he saw a saxophone player. How do we find that out? Well, without getting the communications, and a very important role is, the, is called the alerting role, the boundary spanner. This is the person who's flitting around, the, in one way can be flitting around from team to team to team. I often see business analysts in this role. They're running from one team to another team, chatting with them. What's happening here? What are you doing? Whoa, 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 what? What's that? No, 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 come on. We gotta go talk over, we gotta go over here and talk because that doesn't sound right. What, you're, what I'm hearing from you doesn't sound right from this person. This role is called, frequently in a lot of the literature, is called the boundary spanner. I would say that every project that I've been on, I can point out who the boundary spanners are. They are the people who do, their, they seem to be on, running on four triple lattes, running from team to team. <coughs> Who, there was somebody in my tutorial yesterday who called herself Wonder Woman. It's, uh, this is what I was thinking of. <laughs> Does that feel like your role? Yeah. And how, what, how, you hear, and you would do, is it often a situation you'll hear one, you'll hear a perspective mismatch between one team and the other? Um. Yes, well, I, I just have one team, and they're actually quite good in the scrum in the morning, uh, expressing their uh, impediments. And then they themselves go, oh, this is maybe related to this. We're in one big open office, and one can say, oh, this is crashing um, this morning. Um, one guy on another team actually had an issue, and then very quickly they, uh, one of the other developers said, hey, that issue is me. Um, anybody else having issues, and then they're, they're quite good at the fixing themselves, but uh, yes, I do run around and, um, and speak to them all day to make sure that everybody is on track. This is a role that you really can't appoint someone to do it. This is almost like you rise to the occasion. And I said, it's one of the critical roles I've seen in so many organizations. But it's not only necessarily just the person running around. How many, how many of you have got can say in our organization, they are, 
Oh, you've got an architectural issue? Okay, um, go talk to um, jo Joanna. Joanna. Go talk to Joanna. I have seen in organizations where there is this one person that everyone goes to to talk about the architecture of the system, or yeah, Joanna knows about that part of the system, go talk to her. So people go to Joanna to talk to her. And as she's getting this line of conversations, all of a sudden it twigs on her, whoa, wait a minute. What you just said, what I heard, that doesn't make sense. We better get together and talk about this. So these are, this is a really pretty critical role here. This is, you know, looking at your organization. Can you find these people? Are your processes enabling this? Are there boundary spanners? Are people taking that response? Or more correctly, what are some, what are the impediments to a person being a boundary spanner? I'm currently working for a client that's a highly distributed organization. About 60% of their staff work at home. This is the first time I have worked with a client that, this is a large client. We are talking of a very, you know, we're talking of a client with over 5,000 people in their IT staff. And 60% of them work from home. And they're scattered all over North America. One of the things that I'm finding right now, working with, is there are very few boundary spanners. And we spend a lot of time, you know, we're spending a lot of time resolving the different perspective, discover, going down a path and suddenly discovering, oh my goodness, I thought we were doing this. This morning, I don't know if some of you even saw me sitting out there having a, I missed Linda's presentation because for a half hour, was having a phone call with the, with the project management office where they just suddenly, we all suddenly discovered, no, this initiative we've been working on for the last six weeks does not fall in our scope. This is out of our scope. We've just wasted a lot of effort there. Something that had we been able to get together and to the point where I finally got frustrated enough that I'm going, flying to Hartford next week. Um, because we'll get more done in three days than we have been able to get done in three months for exactly that reason. Because this, in my view, this function, this behavior, this capability has been severely limited by the fact that we're so highly distributed. Finally, the drum beater. Who keeps us moving forward? Remember that U curve we saw there relating performance and communications, right? The more communications we had, the better it got, better performance went up, and then it started dropping down. How many of you have been in meetings where you just go around and around in a circle? Yeah, all of us. We're going, often we're going around and around in a circle because we simply don't know what the problem is. We don't have enough information to make a decision. So somebody has to say, finally, you know, fess up and say, you know, we don't have enough information to make, either we don't have enough information to make that decision, so we've got to decide on something. So maybe the decision is we need to go out and get the information we need. But let's stop going around in circles and find out what we really need. Somebody to take a spike. Grab a spike, go out, come back tomorrow and tell us. Or maybe another case of this is we've got three, four equally good alternatives. And we're all around, going around the table, are you arguing for our favorite alternative when it comes down to we've got three equally good alternatives. Pick one, let's move forward. I have seen projects get bogged down where a decision, all before the lack of making a decision. They could not make that decision because no one said, let's make a decision. Everyone was looking for the, try to make the best decision. Given that we're, you know, like sometimes I like to inject mil a military angle into this. Anyone here former military? There's a, say, there's a mantra that's given to officers in the military that goes something along the lines of, 
make a decision. If it's the right one, so much the better. <laughs> and um, my memory may be fading on me, but I think it wasn't it Yes who had the song, if you don't make a decision, then that's a decision too. This is the kind of thing. So this person, this role here is about let's get a decision. All of these here are, you can see here the two things that we're trying to accomplish in these roles. One, avoid locking the orientation. Get everyone, try to work towards getting people's perspectives aligned. Two, get a decision made. That fast decision making cycle. So, how do we make this all practical? How do, we bring, how do we bring this back down to earth, saying that's all really nice theory, Steve, good, 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 good. I think that was really cool. Yeah, that sounds very academic. How do we make this real? So part of the assessment in an organization that I like to take then is say, can we do agile? Can we do agile in this organization? What are the questions that I really want to start asking? One of the most fundamental Is there a product owner or equivalent that's available on a timely basis? Is there a product owner who's going to be able to make a decision? Who's going to be able to give us feedback quickly? Do we have a person or group that's in that role? Can they shelter the team? Can they be a drum beater? The situation where we may not have this, for example, um, I've been working with a local client here where we've used this chart. Their government organization, a lot of their work goes out to tender. And we're saying, well, can we be agile? Part of the question is, even if our vendor is agile, can we be agile? In other words, if they give us a result, can we field a group or a person who will be available to them as the product owner? Because if we say, we write in our contract, yes, you must be agile, and you must give us product every two weeks, but we can't accept it, there's no point in running that project as an agile project. We don't have a drum beater there. We do not have a person who can provide shelter. We don't have a way of getting fat. There's, this is not, we are fooling ourselves. We are not going to get the fast feedback cycles that we need. Is a team capable of creating valuable work products and generating valuable feedback in a timely manner? So is the team closely located? Do they have fast communications between them? Do they have, the boundary, do they have a boundary spanner available to them? Do they have someone who can shelter them? Can the team create the work products? Are they, are they co-located or near co-located? Because if they're not, we're probably not going to be able to do this. Are they capable of accepting work as fast as it's being delivered? Is the team willing to accept the feedback? Are there boundary spanners who are proactively looking out for issues and will alert individuals and team throughout the value stream to mismatches in perspective? This to me is one of the most important. The first view I can justify is this is traditional agile commentary, but really saying, is there a person or a group of people who will take it on themselves to go and check? Because we know that the developers do want to be naturally heads down. They, they're going to see that ink block. One's going to see the girl, one's going to see the saxophone player, and they're both going to think they're doing the right thing, and they're not going to talk to each other. So am I going to be in there and, and start talking to them and start talking to them and find out, whoa, wait a minute. The way you're seeing the world and the way you're seeing the world isn't matching here. You've got different perspectives. We've got to talk before this becomes a problem. Is there somebody who can shelter the team from interruptions? Is there a mentor who can support the team? 
I mean, this sounds like what I have found in many organizations, they set up with a project manager, they set up with a scrum master. The team has no mentor to support the team. There's like usually, I remember in the old days, it seemed this is something that's really struck me as being very bizarre in the agile world in some ways. In the old days, who remembers when we used to have a person called the team lead? Right? What was the job of the team lead? Ask assignments. Hey, pardon? Task assignment. Task assignment. So we, you know, we were an arm, we were an extension of the, uh, we were an extension of the project manager. But usually we were also the senior engineer. Right? We were the senior engineer, and we were meant to, we, took, we took responsibility for mentoring the other team members. Supposedly, this is part of the role of a scrum master, potentially the scrum master or coach, but it seems to be something that's fallen, up, fallen off the table. I don't see this happening in a lot of organizations. It's like, yeah, we hired a coach for, yeah, we had a coach in here to teach people agile, and uh, we got the team agile, but there isn't that ongoing dedication to mentoring the team. And are the team members capable of making timely decisions? Do they have the drum beater? Is somebody saying, guys, we need to make a decision here. If we can't, then what do we need to make that decision? What do we have to do to get the data that we need to make this decision? Because we can't keep going around in circles. We are wasting time. And remember something here. Do put it this way, as developers, as engineers, as members of a team, as employees of an organization, we cost the company. We are a fixed, co we are a fixed cost in that organization. Whether we're creating anything that's valuable or not, we are a fixed cost. You, know, you do the calculations. What's the average burden rate? About $150 an hour for a company, per person. Whether or not you're developed, whether if you cannot make a decision as to what is really valuable, you are going to go down a path where you're not creating value. This is how a lot of waste gets created in organizations. We need to be able to make those timely decisions. So are we capable of doing that? So this is a basically a configuration, this is a chart here that I tend to use now with organizations to say, are, can we take Agile on for this project? Notice it's not a lot of emphasis. Do we have, can we do continuous integration? Can, do we have test-driven development? I consider those all good things. Those are really good, good enablers for, being to, for helping generate some fast feedback. But if we don't have the fundamental ability as an organization socially to make fast decisions, then in my view, we can't do agile. And we have to address those. We have to basically be able to address those fundamental, why can we, what is impeding us from making decisions? Is it that we're lacking the information? Are we lacking someone who's the boundary spanner? Are we lacking someone who can just be the drum beater? Sometimes that's all it is. Just make a decision. Okay, fine. Sometimes that's all it is. But we really have to say, if we want to be able to be agile, be very fast, do we have a social organization that can do it? So, cat out of the bag. This is, one, this is one organization I've been doing a lot of work with. Actually, I've got, working with TransLink, I've gotten a whole new respect for working with government organizations, especially TransLink, which is so highly visible. And it's quite because, naturally, they're under a lot of government regulations. A lot of their work gets contracted out, and yet they're moving towards agility. Not everything they do is, can be agile, and the agile that they're implementing does not necessarily look like the textbook agile, but it's helping them get better. And one of the big questions we always have is they're, try they're trying to make the assumption now, all projects will be agile. All projects will be agile unless 
you can tell us why it's not going to be. And a big part of it is, can we, put, as we stand at the team, does the team, can the team satisfy these criteria? Do we have a product owner? Do we have someone who can be available to the team? Are there the boundary spanners? So that really helps them make that critical decision. Can we run this as an agile project, or do we have to fall back on our traditional bid methods? And a lot of the, like I said, a lot of their projects go out to bid. So now it's a question of, the vendor says, yes, we can be agile. We have agile practices in our organization. Yeah, we follow that scrum thing. Are they truly agile? And can we be agile with them? Those are the questions we're asking. How are we doing for time here? Still about eight minutes. About eight minutes? I think we'll probably wrap up then. We won't, we'll, uh, we'll not take this exercise. OK. So here's, this, here's some of the points that I want to make out of here. Even in the agile world, people trump process. Something I, I really honestly think we have forgotten a lot about. And, you know, and one thing you've noticed, more and more of the agile conversation is the reassertion of this people trump process. Most of the conferences I've gone to have been a long line of technical practices, but you're now seeing a lot more of this conversation. And for a lot of us as engineers, this is a tough conversation to have because, right, we, you know, it's good quality engineering, right? Good quality code, good quality design that makes, makes a great product. And now suddenly you're having to have this conversation about how we work together as people. Is really, the do is really the dominant part of the conversation. You're seeing much more of this, and it's an important part of the conversation. We have to look at software development as a socio-technical system. Not that, the not that the technical, you know, that we, we build the technical architecture, and then we figure out how people are going to adapt to it. We have to build both together. It's a holistic system. I hate using that West Coast word, but there's no other word that describes it. We're trying to holistically develop a system both that's both technical and social. We can't optimize the technical system and expect the, the social system simply to emerge. This is one of the common mistakes that does get made in agile transformations. We do the cargo cult agile thing. We go out. We hire a coach, we put in Scrum, we adopt all the practices, and we forget about changing that social system. Do we have boundary spanners? Will people engage with this? Even though I point you, the product owner, are you going to be available to the team? Can you make timely decisions? Can the team make timely decisions? Can the Scrum Master help them make timely decisions? I've seen a lot of organizations where they put the wrong person in place as a scrum master, that poor person gets bulldozed. The team just, you know, I've actually seen planning sessions where the scrum master is sort of sitting in the background. Obviously, this was the wrong person to be appointed the, the scrum master. What we're trying to do in developing our configurator is adding to the assessment the social factors that seem to trump the technical. <clears throat> Trying to look at what are the, fa the social factors that can inhibit the, a successful adoption or application of Agile to a project. So that's it. Really bringing, returning to this focus of can we do Agile is focusing on, yes, expressing that question and the answer in terms of the social nature of our organization. So we have a few minutes, I guess, for questions. Yeah, I had one question about um, making decisions, and I'm sure this could be a longer answer, but just someone who's beating for making any decisions making a decision with not enough information or whatever. There's obviously in these roles a lot of dysfunction that could occur. Um, so having, uh, I mean, I don't know, thoughts about that, uh, you know, the effectiveness of these roles, the standards and 
filter, you know, I'm just thinking of all the, you know, little micro wrenches that you cause things to happen. They're absolutely great. So did everyone hear the question? Okay. So yeah, I mean, it, just as there can be a, a number of, dis what happens when the people playing these roles are in themselves dysfunctional? Because of course they have their mental model. Sure, right. And I mean, that's part, part of this is, the, this is the, they're taking the role, for example, in the boundary span. If this person, if I simply came up to you, part of the role is if I just said, oh, I heard from Rebecca that what you're doing is wrong then that would be a dysfunction. Yeah. The boundary spanner is the correct function is, I perceive that there's a difference between you two. What your, your mental model, I think, is different from your mental model. That may be my dysfunction. We get together and you go, Steve, we're OK. Look, see, see, and see. So I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the conversation. But the, where the boundary spanner can dis, go into dysfunction is effectively they become, they, they slip into the command and control model. They become the filter. Same for decision makers, too. So they can be forcing a decision when they don't have the information, and they could get it or should they? I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, but on the, for example, on the decision maker, so the, quite, the observation here is if a decision maker is forcing a decision when we don't have enough information. My argument would sometimes be on that, OK, if we are aware that we're going in without insufficient information, what are the trip points, the fast feedback? Right, that's often what we're That's often the, our whole argument for iterative development. We have short time boxes. We're explore, we are exploring uncertainty. OK, we're going to put our best first guess forward. Put that in front of our product owner, and we're going to get their feedback. And we're going to adjust on that. We're going to adjust on that feedback. We're going to go out and get that, find how to get that information. But if that feedback mechanism doesn't exist in there, that's where those those decisions can become a dysfunction. So the, the question is, we have all these roles. Now I'm defining more roles here. These role, one of the things that really, from our observations, is that these roles are not something that, OK, Kirk, you're now a boundary spanner. And uh, yeah, right. Mahmoud, all right, you're, you're going to be the drum beater. So whenever Kirk can't make a decision, you hit the drum and tell him you've got to make a decision. <laughs> right? Um, that's how. That's not what we're looking for. You cannot no generally, you cannot nominate people to, t to take these roles on. People emerge into these roles. This is where I was bringing up the point of the scrum master who got bulldozed. Right? You can appoint a person to be a scrum master. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be effective in that role. So what you're having to look at is, I know that I need people who can fulfill these roles. They need to be the drum beater. They need to be the boundary spanner. They need to be able to mentor. They need to be able to shelter. Do I have people on a team? Do I have people around my organization who are capable of doing this? Right? This is bringing up the shocking revelation that people are not interchangeable in your business process. You might not have noticed this, but people do actually have different talents, strengths, and personalities. And a big part of the organization now is seeing how do we put, enable people to leverage their talents, their strengths, to do the best to the benefit of the organization. So it's just not, OK. I'm sorry. So Alistair, what's your, what's your job function? So your Alistair's a team lead, right? So Alistair's always going to, that's how we define Alistair. No, we got to start looking at, do we define, you know, what other how do we look at Alistair as a person? What are his strengths? What are the things that he, his personality brings? And how do we balance that with the personality of the other people? Right? OK, who's a Canucks fan here? Right? Right, Desjardins is trying to balance the lines, right? All of a sudden, like, hey, we kicked Newton St. Louis's butt last night. Yes! Right, but that was, he's been playing a game now for the last two months of putting, of putting different players 
on different lines to get those lines performing. Every player in the NHL, even the worst player, is a top-notch hockey player. The performance of the lines is how well do these people all play together? How well does the first line, first offensive line play with the first defensive line? Right? That's, that's the game we're playing here. We've got to take that lesson to heart ourselves. So with that, I'll make some myself available after this. If you have any questions, I want to thank you so much for your participation in this presentation and wish you a good day. <laughs>